So God bless you guys, and welcome back to another episode here on the podcast on the Street Fishing YouTube page. So today, episode number seven, I got my brother in Christ, my brother Darren Ochoa. Um, man, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> Long time coming. Hey, amen, yeah. amen. So I mean, if you want to, I mean, I, I know I said your name, but yeah. if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Darren Ochoa. Um, basically no Ezekiel for a long time we've done ministry together we've done evangelism together um, so kind of excited about doing this when you asked me I was, yeah. I was like yeah let's do it amen yeah. amen yeah no it's 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 been yeah episode seven you know um, we moving along just kind of you know sharing testimonies and, yeah. and having certain topics on, on on this on the episodes um, you know, and like kind of what I was saying when we were praying, like, mm -hmm. you know, just to God be all the glory and, and, you know, that the stories that we have, the testimony we have, may they be a blessing to others, yeah. encouragement to others, you know, and motiv motivation to others. Yeah. So, you know, we just, we're thankful for, for what God has, you know, brought us from. And, you know, I think, I think there's a powerful thing when it comes to sharing our testimonies. Oh, yeah. um, that's something, especially when, when we used to go out street preaching. Mm -hmm. That was something I always tell people because a lot of the times new beginners are like, I don't know what to say. Yeah. And so I would always say, but you, you, the one thing you do got is what God has done in your life. Yeah. And so I think that's that's a huge blessing, um, you know, huge blessing to share. Always, always, you know, huge blessing to share what um, what God has done in our lives. Amen. Amen. So that's what we're here to do, Let's just do to it. to share. <laughs> I'm looking for the question. Yeah. And the, the podcasts have been amazing too. Just seeing the different people that have been coming on, you know, um, just sharing their testimony. Like you said, the, the, there's power in the testimony yeah. that changes lives. Like, you know, your testimony has the power to change somebody's life that I can't reach, and vice versa. So, I'm excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Amen. So let's get straight to let's it. Let's do it. So question number one yeah. would be kind of like how we always start would be. Mm -hmm. What is your church or faith background? Like, did okay. you grow up in the church or did yeah. you come to faith later on? Yeah, so um, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness um, since birth. Oh. So my dad, um, he never went to church, but my mom, um, she became a Jehovah's Witness before I was born. Yeah. So ever since I can remember, you know, I was going to the Kingdom Hall, going to different things that have assembly every year. So I was raised up in the Jehovah's Witness faith as a youth growing up, probably until I um, started kind of doing my own thing as a teenager. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. See, I didn't even know that. Oh, I, really? I mean, I knew I knew you kind of came or your family had Jehovah Witness yeah. there. I didn't know it was from birth, though. Yeah. So yeah. How, how, I mean, how was that like? Growing up like that. Well, it, it's kind of like anything else, right? When you when you grow up, when it's something all you know, that's how mm -hmm. you grow up. So I grew up, yeah. you know, um, no birthday. I was taught not to, um, you know, at school I didn't salute the flag. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the 80s. I was born in 78. So growing up, I mean, that was huge. You know, in class you stood up, you saluted the oh, flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like. I was the only one standing there not saluting, right? And so everybody would be like, hey, how? and I'd be like, oh, my mom would just say, well, tell me it's your religion, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I grew up with a strong reverence for God and a fear for God, you know? Um, and it, it carried with me, I believe, my my whole upbringing until I came to know Christ. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Man. So I guess with that, with what you saying that, it kind of, um, what the question that comes to my mind yeah. Is how was it growing up having no birthdays? Because um, I'm sure that kind of, yeah, especially it, as a kid, it was weird. So it was kind of, it was kind of funny because my dad he never went to church, right? Um, as a young kid, so we never had Christmas trees. We mm. never had, I never had wrapped birthday presents, but my dad would always get me something. So when it was my birthday, mm. my dad would always get me something. Um, Christmas would come. He, what do you want? You know, he would make sure I had something, uh, you know, a bike. I remember one year he got me a uh, one of them trikes, you know, you pull with the emergency wheel. It's yeah. a three-wheeler oh, yeah, with the plastic yeah. wheels, the Knight Rider thing. So he would he would take care of me. He would get me things. But it was never said like Christmas, you know. It was never yeah. like a Christmas gift. He respected my mother, you know, and, and her faith. But um, my dad took care of me. 
But as far as school birthday stuff, um, never partook in um, birthday celebrations and stuff like that. So it was it kind of felt excluded, you know, around my friends and stuff and around school like that. Yeah. Um, but it was something that I was just used to. I would go door to door. So as a young kid, I guess evangelism was instilled in me because uh, I would go door to door as a young kid, man, and oh, and yeah, I'd be yeah. preaching preaching their faith, you know, with, with the books, <laughs> knocking on the door and yeah. and um, handing them watchtowers and awakes and stuff like that, not even knowing that God was preparing me for, for the true faith, you know, later amen, on. Amen. Yeah. So with the I really believe, like the Bible says, what the enemy meant for bad, God turns it around and makes it for good. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So you were pretty much in training. That's yeah. Isaac and young kid. Yeah. Hey, man. Mm. yeah, it's it's funny because like uh what you said about the birthday thing or the Christmas thing. Mm. Um, that's kinda how it was in our household. Mm. Um, you know, so we grew up in a in an apostolic denomination church. Okay. So and, and my dad was a pastor. Mm -hmm. So we did we didn't celebrate Christmas, that wasn't something we celebrated. Yeah. But when it came to Christmas time, we got presents or not presents, but yeah. <laughs> we got stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. So we still went out. He would still go out, you know, buy stuff. We just wouldn't call it Christmas gift. Mm -hmm. And so from a young age, we're like, um, you know, Santa's not real. Yeah. So we're going to elementary school. No, like Santa's not real. Yeah. <laughs> so that that was something I could I could definitely relate to that because mm -hmm. that was yeah we didn't I mean we did the birthdays but the Christmas thing yeah it was it was exactly like that because wow. apostolics. Do not celebrate Christmas. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. So that's that's so no tree, no nothing. No, either. no tree, okay. no decorations. Yeah. I so. mean, it wasn't until I think um I got married with my wife mm -hmm. that uh, you know, she she started putting decorations and stuff yeah. like that. But even up until then, um, even after coming to the Lord, I was still even though I wasn't in, in that organization mm -hmm. uh that we grew up in, that it was instilled in me you know yeah. i was indoctrinated in that yeah. so i still held that you know anti-tree anti-christmas yeah like and i preached hard about it uh -huh. <laughs> found all the scriptures huh? <laughs> yeah yeah the jeremiah yeah, yeah like no, don't put no decorating yeah no tree, you know, like, like man i came yeah. hard with the whole pagan <laughs> this and yeah so it wasn't until you know uh, a little bit after i got married with my wife it just you know, it, it was something where, like, the Lord just kind of, like, you know, like, there's no... I, I, where I am now is just, it doesn't matter no more. Yeah. Like, it, there's more important things, mm -hmm. like salvation, Yeah. that, you know, matter to me more than whether we celebrate this or not. Yeah. And I was in bondage to a lot of that as well. You know, when I came to the faith, had a lot of questions and stuff when I became born again. Um, but the scripture that God spoke to me that really gave me peace it was, I forget the um, chapter and verse, but it says, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord, right? Yeah. Whether in word or deed, do it unto the Lord. Yeah. So anything that we do, we do it on unto the Lord. So he gave me a peace about that. You know, I believe it's about our motives. Why are we doing things? Yeah, amen. Yeah, Colossians 3.17. Yeah, what, can you read it real quick? Yeah, it says, uh, KJV says... And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Yeah. So he gave Amen. me peace about that. Whatever we do, you know, if we can do it with thanksgiving unto the Lord and glorify him through it, then I have peace about it. Yeah, Amen. If Amen. it brings him glory. You know? So, man, growing up, Jehovah Witness, um, I guess, so growing up in that, you said you kind of were going out with them, you know. Um, where did, I guess, the separation happen? Or where did you start to kind of veer off from that? Okay, so my parents, they got divorced, right, mm -hmm. um, when I was probably around 10 or 11 years old. And, like, that's when my life kind of started shifting and changing. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up like any normal kid as far as... Um, you know, like baseball, like to ride skateboards, collected baseball cards. That was yeah. real big for yeah. me, um, stuff like that. And um, the circumstances that my my parents got divorced, you know, it brought a lot of anger and a lot of pain to me. Mm -hmm. And um, my heart became hardened at that point. So I really didn't want to um, 
I became really rebellious, you know, uh -huh. and so um, I started using drugs young, you know, probably around 13 or 14, I started smoking weed, um, and my mom was a single mother, you know, she worked oh, two yeah. jobs, man, so we were, I was all over the place, you know, I would go to school, I'd go to my friend's house after school, my mom wouldn't get home till four or five, you know, so basically she would just, she was doing what she had to do to provide for our family, mm -hmm. and I was out doing what I wanted to do, you know, yeah. and uh, getting caught up in a lot of things, and I kind of stopped going um, when I hit my teenage years, okay. got involved in drugs and gangs and things like that. Okay, so yeah. uh, so t uh, I guess we could, touching a little bit on that, um, yeah. when, so you, you said you got involved with drugs around 13. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's like what, middle school going into high school. Yeah. About eighth grade around there. Mm -hmm. Um, the drug thing. So where, where did the, the gang come in? Like in high school? So, um, we grew up in a neighborhood that was close by, mm -hmm. um, elementary school. I have, I had friends, you know, and older, um, uh, their older brothers were in gangs. Um, their fathers were, you know, dealing oh, and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So I was around it, but I wasn't really in it. You mm -hmm. know, I wasn't in the gang yeah. but i had friends and neighborhood friends that were involved in gangs mm -hmm. so i grew up around it from element i say around fifth or sixth grade is really when okay. that that vibe started happening for me and we tried to create our own little gangs and you know and think <laughs> neighborhood gangs and stuff like that yeah. and then when i got to junior high um seventh and eighth grade is when i started really really getting involved i mean pretty heavy yeah, in gangs, but, I think you know. I think at those times, I think yeah, middle school was pretty, where kind of where it would, it would begin. Yeah, because in middle school you usually had like the little brothers mm -hmm. of those that were in high school or a little older that were in it. Yeah, so you had yeah the little brothers, you know, acting or trying to be like mm -hmm. the older brothers or yeah. even you know the parents. So I, could, I think that was yeah that was around the time when I got exposed to it, um, middle school. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like in, in similar to what you're saying, um, you know, I was, you know, I was seeing it. Um, I had some uncles involved. Um, so it was kind of there, but it was, I wasn't, you know, I was still a kid mode. Yeah. And it wasn't until middle school where certain friends that I, you know, became friends with, mm -hmm. then they're, you know, the, the way they were dressing was yeah. different than all my other friends. Yeah. So it was that was kind of like when I started to get exposed, like middle school around there, mm -hmm. um, seeing that, and so, so uh, I guess it, going into a little bit more with that, that's, that's part of the business. <laughs> we are back, you guys. Yeah. So we yeah. had some technical difficulties. Um, I'm trying out something for the first time, and now I know what to do next time. <laughs> But going back to the question that I asked, I don't know if it caught it, but the yeah. question that I asked was, um, where did it start to get, you know, serious when you started to, um, you know, where it wasn't just small acts of, you know, being rebellion or whatever, yeah. but when it started to like, you know, you doing wrong. Yeah, I would say. Uh... So it began probably around uh, seventh or eighth grade. I started getting in a lot of trouble, and uh, I got in trouble at school. First, uh, it, I got caught with brass knuckles, I believe, in seventh grade, which was almost lightweight a felony because they they were illegal brass oh, knuckles yeah. at that time. I a, a friend of mine, they weren't even mine. It was just silly stuff. A friend was showing me his brass knuckles. He asked me if I want to buy them. So I was in the bathroom, I put them on my hand, and I'm looking at them, and the principal walks in, and I got them on, I got them on my hand, right? So he's like, come with me. So I got busted for that, you know, um, which wasn't, wasn't too major. Um, I got suspended for that, came back, and then um, got in trouble at school. We were in wood shop, and there was a, there was a, a kid in there, a guy we went to school with, and I don't remember what happened, but I remember uh, I put a knife to his back in class. Mm -hmm. I put my hand around his neck and I put the knife to his back and um, he jumped, right? I wasn't going to, you know, stab him. I was, I was trying to scare him and he jumped and the, and the knife punctured his back. Oh, wow. And so 
Um, I let go of him, and he said he had to go to the bathroom, and then he, he left, and he went to the office, and then the police came, and they came and got me for that, and they got me for uh, assault with a deadly weapon, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's when things started happening for me because I got kicked out of that school. Um, and how old were you when that happened? I was probably around 14, 15 oh, years wow. old at that time. And then I ended up getting kicked out of um, every school in um, Contra Costa County. So I couldn't go to any school from Br from Brentwood to Martinez. My mom tried to get me in a school. No one would accept me. Man. I went to Antioch Junior High. I forget what time in between there. Um, got kicked out of there. Um, and I ended up in a school called County Day. It was mm -hmm. a county school for kids that um, would get in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I met um, some gang members from Pittsburgh. So once I met a certain gang member from Pittsburgh, that's when everything began because I linked him up with um, my homeboys in Antioch. And once we linked up, I mean, um, we started robbing houses um, oh, wow. every day, pretty much before school. I was still in school. We'd um, go rob houses before school and then go to school, um, drink 40s <laughs> before school, um, smoke weed. Um, so that's how I got my money. I bought my first car probably when I was 16 oh, from man. robbing houses and, and doing things like that and just criminal activity. Um, started u using methamphetamine, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, it, and things just started getting bad. You know, I bought my first gun, I think, was at Antioch Junior High from a guy there. He was a little, oh, wow. little 22. I bought that. That was my first, first weapon. And then we started getting involved with, you know, getting other guns and, and doing all types of stuff that wasn't good Dang, that's you know, not even high school yet no i wasn't even <laughs> in high school yet at that time so Man. i pretty much was just in and out of high school by the grace of god i graduated yeah. i graduated from live oak high school which was a continuation yeah. school but I, I was you know i was involved in gangs all all throughout high school and and things like that oh wow yeah man so man you started off young yeah. Young, um, robbing or breaking and entering. Mm -hmm. um, man. So I guess my question would be, um, did your was your mom sort of aware of like how she, bad he was? Yeah, I think she knew. I'd have friends come over. I have I'd have you know my red rag and you know um, mm -hmm. Dickies. You know. I mean, I had the full full attire. Yeah. You know, <laughs> my my friends would come over. We'd swim, uh, we would drink beer at the house. You know, oh, and, wow. and she'd be like, "Okay, you know, you just don't go. No, you could drink here or whatever." So yeah. she, I guess, she figured it's better for me to do it there than, yeah. than go out, you know, and um, do it somewhere else. Yeah. So I was doing that. I remember, you know, she would take me to school, and I would, I would. Uh, be doing drugs i put you know methamphetamine in my pepsi can you know before going to school and drink drink down the can of oh, pepsi man. and, and uh, she never knew you know she found stuff she would find stuff i had pipes in my room um guns um and knives she would find them and she would take them they disappear and i asked her hey mom you know where where's my gun or, or where's my knife she, i don't what are you talking about you know <laughs> and then so when i got older um she told me, she said, hey, I found a bag in, in the garage and it was some of my old guns and knives and stuff in a bag that she had hidden. Yeah. And she um, she gave them back to me, but I got rid of them. I was already I was already saved at that time. You know? <laughs> but it was a long time. She has hid them off in the, in the garage somewhere. Yeah. I found a bunch of knives and stuff like that. But oh, that's what she would she would do. Yeah. <laughs> she, instead of confronting me, she figured it'd be easier just to take them you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and get rid of them. Yeah, I think I think when it comes to like to that point, um, especially being a single mom mm -hmm. working, um, yeah, I think I, I think it becomes hard for them to where they almost don't even know what to do or even how to yeah. handle the situation. Um, I know, like with us, um, you know, so my my pops passed away when I was seventeen, mm -hmm. and I'm the oldest of five. Yeah. So I was 17 and, you know, uh, two years, basically, each kid before that. So when my when my pops passed away, um, my mom had to work, mm. you know, had to work. So and she worked, I believe, 
if I remember, I think she worked like like a later swing. So she worked from like four to like midnight, one in the morning, something like that. Yeah. So pretty much all afternoon, it was just us. And at that time, we were pretty much we were doing everything we wanted to do. Yeah. Out in the street. I mean, we weren't really like, or at least like my younger, you know, my younger siblings, they weren't really out doing trouble. Mm -hmm. But just they had, I guess you could say, freedom to do whatever they wanted. Yeah. They could walk here, there, go like here and there. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really have no parental supervision. Yeah. Um, you know, unless we went to like family's house. Mm -hmm. But we pretty much did whatever we wanted. Latchkey kids. Yeah. yeah. So it. I think I think in those cases it, it, it's hard for the parent because yeah it's, you know, they don't know especially when they don't come from that lifestyle themselves yeah I think it's they don't you know how to handle the situation mm -hmm. or what can they do yeah and it's just kind of like how you were saying like the the what she saw like the best way to to handle it mm -hmm. was to basically have you doing it you know where yeah. she can keep an eye on you yeah. she might not be able to stop you but at least she knows. You know, she where it's still kind of in in her control. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it's 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 hard for parents, man. Mm -hmm. um, that was one thing that for sure. Like after I got saved, um, man, she, you know, I, I can't even count how many times I, I've told my mom, "I'm mm -hmm. sorry." Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's 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 hard. It's yeah. hard. Um, but yeah, going into that, like, man, so you weren't even in high school yet, so. I'm assuming high school, it it got worse, right? Or it got worse, yeah. But it was, it was low key, you know. Uh, but it, it did get worse. People mm -hmm. I hung around with, we we were, we were different groups, but the same same gangs, you yeah, know. Yeah. So we we all kind of meshed together, um, did a lot of stuff, you know. So did you ever, um, you know, do time or get arrested or? So I got yeah, I got. Arrested a couple times, but I really didn't do uh, a lot of time. I got I got in a high speed chase. I think after I got my license, my sister let me borrow her car, and a couple friends. We had we had some guns, and we were testing them out. You know, out on the mm -hmm. back road of Oakley, and there was a guy um, we didn't see. He was out there with his lights off, and uh, I think he's with his girlfriend or whatever older guy, and we were shooting out there, and, and he started following us. So. <laughs> Cops got on us, so um, time I got, he chased us from Oakley all the way to Pittsburgh. When I got off on Pittsburgh um, Railroad, that's when the cops started chasing me, and they had, like, barricade, we kept going, and they barricaded us and, and took the car. That's my sister. She just got the car, yeah, and she let me man. borrow it. We, <laughs> we, you know, we got, got arrested for that, you know, got caught with drugs and guns and a bunch of other stuff, but... I really didn't start going to jail until uh, I was older. I mean, I got a lot of stuff on my record as a youth. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I went to juvenile court all the time. My mom was always getting phone calls, having to go oh, to court yeah, with yeah. me. But by, I mean, by the grace of God, I didn't, I didn't really do any time in juvie. You know, with all the stuff that I was doing, I mean, the judge was like super lenient, like should have went to jail. She told me all this stuff, but I mean, it seemed like I had favor every time yeah. I went. Like there was probation. I was on probation my entire youth. I mean, I worked at every place you could think of. I worked at the dog kennel. I worked at the uh, at, well, the Antioch shelter, dog shelter. Mm -hmm. I worked there. I worked at the um, at the Antioch library multiple times, having to do you know my community yeah. service. They gave me community service time versus um, you jail know time. jail time, juvenile hall time. Yeah, so I got man. grace in that area, but I, I did all types of community service hours as as a youth you hey know. that, that yeah. definitely speaks of you know god having his hand over you definitely yeah. showing like there there was a plan on your life yeah. for sure um because i mean that's <laughs> that's that's yeah. interesting yeah so where uh, you know you mostly instead of doing jail time you're doing more probation time than anything yeah so that's man that's that to me speaks of definitely god already having his hand upon your life yeah, um definitely. you know for for plans to come looking back at that too like the guy who was with me we threw the gun out the car right so they were charging me with the gun because i was the driver yeah and 
everything else they found. But another one of my homeboys, he ended up going to jail. He did months in um, in Byron Boys Ranch for that, I believe. Um, so, and I didn't end up doing any time. Oh wow! You know, so I, it, like you talk, looking back, you know, it's like dang. You know, you wonder how that was, you know, because yeah. I was I wasn't the type of I wasn't telling on I got like all my paperwork was clean. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. telling on anybody, you know, <laughs> I was like my attitude was like whatever, you know, I'm not saying nothing and stuff like that I was really hard head, hard headed, um, stubborn, you know, growing up. I had no respect for authority. I would I mean, I would disrespect police officers, teachers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my mouth would get me. In, I mean, I'm quiet now. Oh, you know, I don't say much yeah, now. But when, yeah. I was, when I was younger, ever since I was a little kid, um, even in elementary, I would talk major smack to everybody. Oh, and I remember older kids. I had an older brother. He was four years older than me. And um, the people that, you know, that were older than me, I would talk smack to them. They're like, well, wait till you get older. <laughs> you, 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 you're gonna get it you know and i just continued that that way you know yeah. Talk, talking smack you know j joking and clowning on people yeah. but um yeah that's just how i grew yeah, up <laughs> yeah it's funny because yeah. i so i was i was the opposite yeah me as a kid or you know growing up uh i was the silent yeah like i almost didn't speak um and it's and it's 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 like a lot of my family can 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 attest to this, where it's just it's part of the testimony, I guess, the the transformation. Yeah. Because now, when you see me, you know, I'm always talking, yeah. smile on my face, always happy, joyful. Mm -hmm. But before, like, I was silent. Yeah. Almost, I mean, you almost didn't even know I was there because mm. I would just sit there observing everything, yeah. quiet. And now it's like, you know, I just. I don't know. I guess I just I just have so much of uh, the joy of the Lord. Yeah. Whereas like I'm always, you know, <laughs> yeah. you can't stop me now. Yeah. Especially when it comes to speaking about God. Yeah, and you're genuine. Like even this conversation here is just like it just flows. Yeah. You know, so I can definitely see it. Yeah, like yeah. none of this is part of the questions that I. Say. Yeah. <laughs> It's Except like the first right. two, yeah, the first two questions. But I think, yeah, I think that's what makes the the this podcast, you know, where um, it it makes it more, I guess, genuine. Yeah, like how you said, um, because I mean, yeah, we have like a what you would call like an outline of the mm -hmm. questions. And for those that don't know, I did send them some questions that I was gonna ask, um, but pretty much like every episode that I've had, yeah, uh, so far. I've been those questions, mm -hmm. but we've almost haven't gone through all of them. Yeah. We maybe go through like three, four of them, but it just goes how the flow is, how the, yeah. you know, the flow of the, of the, the podcast, the flow yeah. of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's basically what I'm trying to do with this. It's more or less like not in a way of like, I'm interviewing you mm -hmm. or interviewing the, the guest, but more of like just talking, Conversation. conversating. And I think it, it was, uh, I, I can't remember who I was talking to about it. Um, I want to say, I think it was with Gabe. Um, well, basically, it was just like, just imagine we sat down and you're we're talking about your testimony or our testimony. Um, the same concept, but now it's just with lights, cameras. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just like how we sitting down, yeah. you know, just talking, you know, where, where God's brought us from. And, yeah. and I think that's what makes the episodes you know, good, oh, genuine. Yeah. yeah. Um, sure. And I think, you know, it's just, it's real. We're not, we're not forcing it. And it's just, just flow. Yeah. So I it's, agree. yeah, man. So, yeah, I think, you know, like what I was saying before, like the reflection of, of who I am today, um, you know, shows more testimony of the transformation that, that I went through mm -hmm. because who I am today is yeah. definitely not who I was. Yeah. And even people like, if if you know me before to where you see me now, yeah. like let's say if, if we went years without seeing each other, or they saw me in my pre-Christ, mm -hmm. you know, my BC before yeah. Christ, if they saw me BC to where they see me now, um, man, it's 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 a complete different person. Yeah, and I think that's when you truly see um, when when Christ has come into your life, where it's not just you know, you going to church or you starting to read the Bible, or, mm -hmm. but when there's a transformation, yeah. when when there's a transformation in your life, I think that's when really people can see mm -hmm. what God can do. 
Yeah. And so it's it's amazing, man. So uh going back to your testimony, um man, um probation, you know, smoking, um gangs. So I guess where did it come or did there ever come a time where you wanted to change? Um, or did something happen they were like, Man, I need to stop this? Well, I always knew uh, there was something better, you know, there was something different, mm -hmm. like inside of me, like even growing up, I never fit in, right? No matter what I did, no matter where I went, there was something inside of me that told me that I didn't fit in, you know, and I thought it was something wrong with me, yeah. you know, um, but I knew there, there was a God. I just didn't know who he was, yeah. you know, um, I didn't quite agree with the uh, Jehovah's Witness faith just because of some of the things as I got older my brother and sister were baptized as Jehovah's Witnesses and they ended up straying from from that you know as well yeah. somewhat my sister kind of stayed with it for a little bit but my brother ended up going going his way as well and we'd have conversations we'd get drunk you know we smoking weed and we we talk about God right <laughs> I remember this one time we were at his house and we were just like we were talking about God and all of a sudden we were crying and then I was like, man, God's got to be real. You know, yeah. we were just talking about God and, and, uh, you know, there's got to be more to life than what, what this is, you know, and, uh, always wanting to, you know, um, be, be different, but not knowing how, you yeah. know, I think that's, that's what a lot of people struggle with. They want to, they want to do something, but they don't know how, right. They want to quit drinking but they don't know how they want to quit smoking, but they don't know how it, it's become a part of their identity. Right. Yeah. And, um, that's what it had become for me. It become part of my identity. Like my mother, she grew up from a very dark family. My dad's side of the family. Um, they, my, my, my grandmother and grandfather, they grew up. So, um, but yeah, go ahead. So going back to like the drinking and everything like that, um, that I think we can't, was instilled um, at a young age in me. My mother, I was saying that she came from a dark, dark fam, dark side of the family, right? And my dad's side of the family, uh, my grandmother, my grandfather were from Mexico. My grandfather came here when he was young, um, was a migrant worker, you know, uh, always worked, provided for the family, um, kind of honorable, I would say, you mm -hmm. know, um, was against tattoos and everything. Oh. So when I started you know, get, I got my first tattoo, I think, when I was 13. Started my uh, buddy, you know, we, we'd get the little needle, wrap yeah. it with thread, and we start doing tattoos. And I would hide them from my grandfather and stuff. I remember that. But my mom's side of the family was a little different. So I grew up, I'd go over there. Uh, my grandmother um, was a prostitute. Um, mm. And my grandfather, he was a trucker, you know. So I would go over to their house or their trailer where they lived. And then I'd be exposed to like Playgirl magazines, Playboy magazines. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my grandfather would drink like a 24 pack a day, smoke cigarettes. So I remember as a young kid, I mean, he was a, he was great. You know, he was amazing uh, man to me, always cool mm -hmm. and stuff. But it was the stuff I was exposed. You know, yeah, that, the that, vices, the vices that put that root inside of me as a young boy. Seeing yeah. those magazines, um, seeing that beard when he would leave, I would you know, I would take a drink of beer. I remember he would throw his cigarettes down and walk in the house. I wait for him to go in. I pick up the cigarette at, I mean, yeah. young age and start, you know, trying to smoke the cigarette and stuff like that. So I believe it began at a very young age for me mm -hmm. and drinking. Um, I started drinking young, you know, yeah. and my mom, she never wanted to do any of that because she's seen the lifestyle that mm -hmm. her mother lived growing up, you know, my grandmother sister was a, was a witch. Um, they both were kind of psychic. They said they would have, you know, divination spirits. I believe yeah. I, I know that now and stuff like that. So my mom, she didn't want anything to do with that life. You know, she loved her mom, but she prayed when I think she was pregnant with my, my brother and said, God, if you're real, you know, um, just show, show me, you know, that you're real. And a couple of days later, Jehovah's Witnesses showed up at her door, oh, and wow. she took that as a sign from God. Yeah, yeah. So that's when she started getting heavy in Jehovah's Witnesses, and later on, I was born. But um, yeah, fast forward, you know, being around my grandmother and my grandfather, 
Um, and that kind of stuff is kind of what got me, you know, to see all that stuff and instilled, I believe, that into me again. Yeah. And I started drinking young. Yeah, I think that's when, like, generational stuff comes into mm -hmm. play. For sure. Um, you know, where, you know, the grandfather, or the, even to the, the father, mm -hmm. or, you know, the, the parents or grandparents, yeah. um, you know, do something to where it gets not just introduced, but it becomes where... Like how you were saying, you know, there was something that you wanted or you were doing. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, I think, you know, I think generational stuff, generational, you know, curses yeah. are very real. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, there's, there's in, in, in my research or <laughs> in my, um, in my time of looking up on YouTube videos, there's <laughs> apparently people that don't believe in generational curses. Yeah, yeah. That don't believe that that that's something that occurs. Yeah. But it's it's crazy because I think I heard an argument one time. I forgot who said it, but they were like, "How is it that that people there's Christians that don't believe in generational curses, but even doctors believe in it? Because look at what they ask you." Yeah. Do you have a history of diabetes? Do you have a history of this? Yeah. They ask you, what do you have a history mm -hmm. of in your family? Yeah, and they think it's hereditary. Yeah. Right? But, yeah. It, but it's actually <laughs> familiar spirits yeah. passing from generation to generation. Because when you have families, right, you have generations of uncles, cousins, brothers getting murdered, right? Mm -hmm. Cancer down the bloodline. You yeah. can trace it all the way down. Things like that just doesn't don't happen. You know, something happened along the way doors were opened um that's what i you know believe i've seen things broken over people's life over my life amen. you know and true freedom comes hey, amen i i agree man yeah. i agree definitely um like how you were saying man like you have family that that you know are doing stuff then that ain't introduced and i believe if i'm mistaken the bible says that it could go up to the fourth generation yeah so it's 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 not something where I well, I guess to say um, that's where we we have to be careful what we do, um, you know, for those that are not living right, those that are or even maybe even have a hidden sin. Yeah, that's where we have to be careful because we might not see the consequence, mm -hmm. our children might not even see our consequence, yeah. or or even our grandchildren might not even see it, mm -hmm. but up to the fourth generation. That fourth generation that had nothing to do with it is yeah. suffering because of something exactly. we did. And if you just think about that, it's like if people would just get it, like, hey, look, what you're doing right now will affect your children, mm -hmm. your children's children, and your children's children's children. And uh -huh. people don't realize that. You know, from one to six, it says that the curse will right follow from the third to the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says after that, the blessing follows a thousand generations yeah. right how, how beautiful is that you know when you when you come out from under the curse and enter into the blessing yeah, right and, and your family is blessed your children are blessed your children's children are blessed i mean that's that's a wonderful thing yeah the the, the verse that comes to my mind talking about this it's in acts 2 39 you know after they after they get baptized with the holy spirit yeah. you know uh so the verse 39 says this, for the promise is unto you and unto your children and unto their, their our, oh man, it's King James. <laughs> for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are, are off, are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Yeah. So even when, like with that, like, man, like the, the Holy, uh, going on with that, the, the gift or the blessing mm -hmm can you know be passed on not just from you but to your children yeah. and to your children's children so it's definitely like what do you want what do you prefer do you want cursing to yeah. be passed down or do you yeah. want blessing to be passed down? exactly so that's yeah. definitely where we have to be you know cautious of what we do now yeah. because whether we're you know whether we're involved in cursing or you know or blessing mm -hmm. that's going to be passed down either yeah. one of the two yeah. so it's definitely something to take you know, take uh take into consideration yeah, when sure. when we do stuff now. Yeah. Um your camera shut off. Oh man. Um so I guess where going I guess a little bit back, where did it come a time where cause you say you are, you kinda you know, because of how you grew up, yeah. you know, being instilled and in, in believing in God, fearing God, um, and despite everything that you were doing, you said you kinda knew, you know, um, that you were kind of 
supposed to, you know, I guess go the godly way. So when did that come about? So I, I'd say I had thoughts like there was more to life, mm -hmm. you know, believed in God, but wasn't living for God, wasn't serving God, didn't know who God was. Um, I would say um, it, it's, it's hard to say it wasn't until I, I became born again. I mean, until I had little incidences before I got born again. Mm -hmm. where I met people that were talking about Jesus, you know, before yeah. I got born again, I had uh, friends that a fr specific friend I used to gang bang with is, uh, they used to call him Diablo and he got an accident, almost died and he um, got radically saved Oh wow. and he would walk all around um, until he recovered. I mean, he had to re his whole, you know, he split his, his cranium open and really got hurt. So he, it was a while before he can drive again, but I mean, he was radically saved when I seen him. He would invite me to, you know, men's breakfast and stuff oh, all the man. time. And I, I didn't want nothing to do with it, you know, but he would plant those seeds. Yeah. And, um, you know, those are all seeds planted. I was still doing what I was doing. He invited me and I said, oh, man, I'm good. You know, I'm good. And um, I really didn't have any change until... Um, I was 30. I mean, even when I met my wife, mm -hmm. I mean, I was running. I, w I was running. I was 30 years old. Yeah. Um, and I, I, well, I met her, I think, uh, before I was 30, yeah, to about 25, 26. And uh, I was getting arrested. We were getting arrested together. I don't know if you've seen our, our mug shots yeah, yeah, yeah. together. Yeah, I think I remember yeah. the time we went to Denny's where you said, I think, your guys' first date. Y'all yeah, got arrested? One of our first dates, yeah. <laughs> We went, we went to a club, and and, and uh, I think someone put something in our drink. We didn't remember leaving. We ended up crashing and um, got arrested. I got a DUI and oh, went to man. jail. And, uh, so, I mean, I wasn't learning my lesson. That was, I was already, that was my, I think, my third DUI. Oh, uh, wow. So my, my fourth DUI is when um, everything had changed. My life began to change, you know, um, so I don't know if you want to get into when I got saved or yeah yeah let's yeah, do it yeah, yeah. yeah. so getting uh, so when you when you get saved in two thousand eight two thousand oh man yeah. same year as I did yeah two thousand eight I was um, out of work I was unemployed I I was a plumber by trade plumber pipe fitter I went through a uh -huh. five year apprenticeship in two thousand so I had a good job you know I was working and still doing what I was doing. Um, getting in trouble, drinking, you know, smoking, and selling drugs and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I maintained a job all the time. Yeah. You know, um, so I had my money from from my job, which was which was good money. But in two thousand eight, the the market dropped. Right. Mm -hmm. um, two thousand four, I got a DUI um, when I met my wife. Got another one in two thousand five, um, and then another one so i did time in 2005 for my second dui the judge said if i get another one i was going to go to prison so in 2008 the market crashed um i wasn't working mm -hmm. construction jobs you know plummeted and so i was out of work um had no had no um job i was trying to you know i was selling coke using coke you know i'm just drinking all the time and I ended up getting um, my my fourth DUI. It was actually oh, my third, but my fourth since I was 16. Yeah. So I got that third one, and, and it was I was still on probation for my second, my third one. And then I I ended up you know going to jail for that one, but I got another one. And then um, that's when I was like I couldn't stop drinking. I told my wife I was gonna stop. I knew I was going to go to prison because it, the judge told me I was. Mm -hmm. I pretty much knew it was a wrap. So uh, I told my wife I'd stop drinking. You know, I couldn't. I would um, sneak tall cans. I'd go get tall cans, and I'd drink them in the driveway, try to throw them in the neighbor's garbage can, <laughs> oh, you know, man. before I went in the house. Um, I couldn't stop, man, you know. And uh, I started looking at my life and all the things, you know, I, I did. And my family possibly not having a home because of where I was going to go and because of what mm -hmm. I did. And I, I just felt a heavy weight on me of, of all the things that I've done, you know, and the people I've disappointed. And my wife was pregnant with Marcos, you know, my son Marcos. Mm -hmm. um, and she was pregnant with him at the time. 
And I was just like, man, I ain't even see my son be born. I'm, my family might be on the, on the, on the, you know, street. So all this stuff was going through my mind and I was, it was weighing me down. And I remember one day my wife, um, I think she was at work and I was home alone. Kids were at school and, um, uh, I was like, this was after my DUI. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was at home and I just, I remember falling down on my kitchen floor and I just cry. I just began crying. And I, and I said, I said, Jesus, I said, if you're real, I said, I need your help. I just, yeah. That's all I remember saying, you know, and mind you, like before all this happened, like some crazy stuff the the two previous jobs that I was on the job sites before that I met this man named Mike. He was a Christian man. And um, we were started this new job. This is before I'll, I'll rewind a little bit because I believe this is what led up to some things. Mm -hmm. um, I went to this job. There was a Christian man. His name was Mike. And um, we went a bunch of pipe fitters on that job. It was a brand new job. And we were all introducing ourselves. It was just starting. Everyone went around and uh, I'm so and so, you know, this and that. And when it got to him, he said, hey, my name is Mike um, and I'm a Christian. He said, and he said, uh, you know, I appreciate, you know, if you guys, you know, don't don't swear around me. He said, it don't hurt my feelings. He said, I just don't, I prefer you don't, you know, I'm a, yeah. man, I'm a man of God. And we ate in trailers. We had lunch and we all kind of laughed at him, you know. Every day at lunch, he would go and read his Bible and stuff. And um, I at that time, my wrist started hurting. Like, I started having issues with my wrist. I didn't know what was wrong. And the first time I ever had anybody pray for me for healing was was this man, Mike. Never even heard of healing oh, before. Wow. And he, he started telling me about Jesus. And he asked me if he can pray for my wrist for the Lord to heal me, that he believed the Lord heals. And I'm like, yeah, man, go ahead, you know. <laughs> and uh, so he did that. He prayed, prayed for me. Uh, and I still had issues with my wrist. That job ended. And I went to another job. And uh, it was in Modesto. Uh, it was at a, a slaughterhouse, and we were working on the roof doing some piping. And there was two young cowboy kids up there working with me. You know, they had Wranglers, cowboy boots. They'd wear cowboy hats. And one day they were talking about Bible study. They're like, we're going to Bible study tonight. And they were talking <laughs> about Jesus and all of that. And I was listening, you know, like like something was being planted. Like yeah. I heard Jesus. like, And I'm like, man, and, and I couldn't get that out of my mind. Like I, I was thinking, like, man, I went to this job. This guy's talking about Jesus. You know, so God was preparing me for oh, what yeah. was about to happen. Oh, yeah. And then so that job ended. And then that's when I got my other DUI. That's when I cried out to Jesus. You know, I believe that's what I was like. Gee, OK, Jesus, if you're real, help me. I just remember weeping on my floor, you know, ugly crying. You know, when your, <laughs> your lips flying in, you, you can't even get your lip right, you know. And I was just, man, all the weight I felt like just like, man, I, I just poured it all out. And I got up from that kitchen floor that day and nothing, you know, I just got up, went about my business and my brother called me and he told me uh, he knew about my, my DUI and what was going to happen. And I didn't know my brother was, went to church. I knew my brother was a Christian, you know, but yeah, we never yeah. talked about it. He never shared really about Jesus with me, you know, when we hang out and stuff. Because a year prior, we we're, you know, um, doing things together, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. And uh uh, he can't, he asked me if he can come over and I said, yeah, come on over. So I want to talk to you. This was probably around a couple of days or a week after I cried out on my kitchen floor and I opened my door, he came over and he, and he had a Bible in his hand and I'm like, man, what, <laughs> what I have, what's this, you know, <laughs> he's like, I want to come in, uh, excuse me. So he came in and he started talking to me about the Lord, man. And, uh, he had his Bible and he opened it up and he started telling me how faithful God was. And he shared his word with me and he, sh he shared a scripture that, you know, God is not a man that he should lie, that God can't lie. Mm -hmm. And he shared Matthew, I believe, uh, Romans 6.33, I believe. It says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? You know, it's only God who justifies. And he looked at me and he says, bro, you ain't going to prison. He says, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Oh, and I'm like, he said, I want you to stand on this scripture. I didn't know what none of that yeah, meant. Right? Yeah. He's going to a word of faith church in Pittsburgh, yeah. learning faith and, uh, you know, the word of God and all this other stuff I knew nothing about. Right. But that scripture, <laughs> I heard it and like it sparked something in me. I'm like, wow, you know, who shall bring a charge? You know, I was yeah. like, oh, he's like, bro, you need to you need to believe this scripture. You need to read this word. 
you know, we cried together, we we hugged, and and uh, he just ensured me, like, with a confidence. Like, I never heard my brother talk with a confidence like that before. It wasn't like I was talking to my brother. It was like a new man. And um, he left me that Bible, man, and um, I began to read that Bible every day. And that's when things began to change for me. Like I would, I would, I was consumed. I couldn't stop. Put I couldn't put it down. I just kept reading it and reading it. And uh, one night, um, probably about two to three weeks after, I was just I was reading it every day. I went to sleep and I had this dream. And in this dream, I walked into a house in this dream, and I sensed evil all around, all around, like just evil. I just felt evil presence. And I walked into this back room. I, I was just led to this back room. There's a back door. Walked in the room, and there's a man back there. And he told me, he says, you've always been trying to get away from me. He says, but you're not going anywhere. He says, I got you. And he put his hand on my chest, and I was, like, paralyzed. I couldn't move. Um, it was like when you, I don't know if you ever had sleep paralysis. When yeah, you yeah. fell asleep, and you can't say a word, you can't move. It, that's That was what happened. And I was like, I was like, it's over. I'm done, you know. And then all of a sudden, that dream switched. That man was gone, and I was standing in a church. And I just remember it, it had a kind of like King's Chapel. Yeah. It had a pointed ceiling like that. And, and I was standing before a table. There was a table in front of me, and there was a man on my left-hand side. And then there was a figure of a man who looked like the Son of God standing in front of me. And the man on my left-hand side said, I'm going to interpret to you what the man in front of you is about to tell you. And so he oh, grabbed wow. my arm and he held my arm up before the man. He grabbed my arm and I looked at him and he didn't tell me anything. He had pictures of me when I was a little boy. He had all these pictures and I remember looking at them. I was remember one picture I had my cowboy boots on when I was a little kid and all these little, like a flash of my childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he grabbed these pictures and he threw them at me. Boom, and they whipped past my head. And came back. And when they came back, I felt something pulled out of my chest. And I watched them disappear oh, wow. into the roof of the church. And I woke up instantly after that. And ever since that day, bro, I, I, I mean, I was divinely changed. I mean, yeah. um, the alcohol I couldn't stop drinking, it was gone. Drug addiction was gone. Perversion was gone. I mean, and I just had a hunger for the word of yeah. God. I began to, um, I told my wife. Um, I began to throw away like everything that I had that, w that was wicked. Yeah. Like um, the Lord really started convicting me. I had Aztec calendars in my house. We had dream catchers. We had Harry Potter movies, like all of these things, like God just started really? highlighting to me. And instantly from that dream, I knew that Jesus was God. Yeah. I woke up knowing that Jesus was God himself. Like yeah. I had a revelation and what God was showing me was like when he talked to Peter, right? A lot of uh, people, he says, Peter, you know, who do you say that I am? He says, some say the prophet Elijah, you know, some say John the Baptist, some say this, some say that. He says, but who do you say I am? And he yeah. says, you are the son of God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. Yeah. And he says, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Yeah. And that right there, it wasn't Peter, the rock. It was the revelation of who Peter knew who the Christ was. And that's what the church is built upon. Once you have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, that's when the church starts getting built. Yeah, that's amen. when things started changing. When that revelation knowledge comes of who Jesus is, that's when transformation comes. And that's when the church starts getting built. You yeah. know, when, when people start testifying of who amen. Jesus is. And that's what happened to me. So my wife thought I was crazy. My family thought <laughs> I was crazy. My wife was like, because just before, I mean, I was smoking weed for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, always high. And all of a sudden now, God came to me in a dream. Now yeah. I'm saved, you know. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me. You know, I didn't even know what happened to me. All I knew was yeah. I was no, I, I was, everything has changed. Like the sound in my house, the things that I look at, the th things that I smell, everything was changed, Man. you know. And, um. And I and I, it, from that day forward, I never dealt with um, drug addiction. I never dealt with ever wanting a drink of alcohol again. And I had a reverential fear for God. Um, I wouldn't drive my car. I walked everywhere. I began taking the bus everywhere because I wanted to honor God in everything that I yeah. did. So that's that's when things started changing. And I'll get in 
you have, you want to have any questions or can I? Continue? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I just just to kind of comment. I mean, it almost sounds like you got delivered through the dream. Yeah, that demon. That was a, a demon that had me my whole life in my yeah. dream, and God freed me from that. Yeah, in, in one man, night. that's yeah. that's powerful. Yeah. And it's it's like yeah like uh, I mean from what it sounds like like basically the pictures passing you know through you or past you to come back it's almost like yeah everything was being pulled out mm -hmm. of what was keeping you um, you know in bondage yeah so that's yeah, man that's that's powerful that's yeah. a powerful because I've I've never heard this yeah so it, it's man that's that's an amazing thing that to to go especially like as radical as that mm -hmm. how you say you have a dream and then all of a sudden you just radically changed yeah radically delivered mm -hmm. like man radically set free and all you wanted to do was was god you know things yeah. that pertain to god so that man that <laughs> glory to god man glory to god so yeah so and meanwhile right i'm still fighting i still have to go to the court for the case Mm -hmm. I got ex homeboys calling me. Where you at? So I got one of the gang leaders calling me, um, saying, "Where you at? How can you ain't come out?" Right. So I'm like, "Man, bro, I, I'm like, I'm serving Christ. I'm like, I, I, I'm born again. You know, I'm trying to share Christ with him. Yeah. And and this particular guy, he's been in out uh, the CYA, you uh, know, the, yeah, the yeah. pen, all that. So he's seen people." just say they're coming to God and this and that. Mm -hmm. So they're like, he's like, man, you better be serious. He says, because if you ain't serious, we coming for you, yeah. you know? So I'm dealing with that. I'm dealing with court uh, and, and this new life that I, I don't know anything about <laughs> yeah. other than the word. Right. So that's why I preach so strongly on the power of the word of God that can change people's life. So I continued, but right after this night, cause I was raised that Jesus wasn't God. Right. Yeah. So I always struggled with that. Like, and from that moment on, there was no more question that yeah. Jesus was God. I, I knew he was Man. God. So I continued reading and about, um, about two weeks went by, right? I'm, I'm still at home. I never even been into a church, mm -hmm. nothing like that. And I'm sitting in my kitchen. I'm reading the book of John, I believe chapter 16. And, um, I'm reading where Jesus told the disciples he said, I have to go away. It's expedient that I go away because yeah. if I don't go away, I can't send the helper. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, I began weeping and I felt this overwhelming power come upon me and I began speaking in a language that I never heard before. Yeah. So I was sitting in my kitchen. I got, now that I know it's bad, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, yeah. reading the book of John where Jesus says, <laughs> I, if I don't go away, I can't send the helper, yeah. right? And then the helper falls on me. And I began speaking in tongues in my kitchen. And at that point is when everything changed. Like, um, I, I, I had questions. I called my brother, like, what happened? He says, bro, you got the Holy Spirit, you know? Because the church he went to, they believed in speaking in tongues. Yeah. And from that moment, the Holy Spirit started teaching me. He started guiding me, and he started showing me what I had to do for my family. And yeah. um, so the first impression was you have to find a church. Yeah. So that was the strongest thing on my heart. Like So I told my wife, we got to find a church, you know? And uh, so we started, we we're on a look for a church. She said, well, I, I, I work with a, a friend. She had a friend named Holly. And they went to a church, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, we're going to church with them this weekend. So we went, it was a Pentecostal church, right? Yeah. So we went in there, bro. And I just remember I went in there and they were worshiping. And um, I just, bro, I just was crying in worship. Uh, I remember the song that said, uh, it was a song, it's all about you. Sorry for the thing, I made it. It's all about you. Yeah. It's all about you, Jesus. And I just began weeping, man, like, like all the things that I've done, like I, I was like, I'm sorry, Lord, like yeah. all the stuff that I've done, denying you, and I just began crying. So I said, okay, how do I join? Mm -hmm. I was serious, you know. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, how yeah. do I join? I want to join the church. And uh, the, well, the pastor says, well, you gotta, we gotta sit down. You gotta meet with us. We have to interview you. I said, you gotta interview me. I said, I want to join you. Yeah, you gotta sit through an interview. <laughs> And I said, okay, well, let's do, the, when we do this interview, so we set the interview up, and um, I remember sitting in that interview, and they had board members or whatever, they were asking me questions, I told them, hey, 
I just got saved at home. Jesus came to me in a dream and they're just looking at me crazy. Right. <laughs> and so, um, they're asking me questions, how long I've been saved. You know, if I belong to a church, I said, no, this is my first church I've been to, yeah. you know? And, um, so they were Pentecost. I said, and then I said, can I ask you a question? They said, yeah. Pastor said, yeah. So I said, do you guys believe in speaking in tongues? I said, because I was told him what happened. Yeah. He said, well, yeah. He said, um, we believe in it, but we don't teach it because um, we don't believe our congregation is mature enough yeah. and they're not ready. They're not oh, ready wow. for that. So we don't, we don't, we believe it in it, but we don't practice yeah, it here in yeah. church and we don't teach our congregation it. And so at that moment, the Lord put in my heart, this, this isn't for you not, leave because yeah. there's compromise, you know? And so I left and that's when my brother invited me to his church, faith worship center ministries in yeah. Pittsburgh. And, and, uh, that's where I was. That's where I got raised up under my apostle anthony blackman until he passed away in 2019 oh wow yeah man that's crazy yeah i mean man yeah. i mean like i said man that's the the way you got saved mm -hmm. i mean that's that's a not typical mm -hmm. uh you know be here say like that's yeah. definitely a radical so i can only yeah. imagine you know when you telling you know the the you know the the the, the board, I guess, mm -hmm. that, that was interviewing, when you telling them how you got saved, and yeah, yeah I, can, I can imagine, like... They were real quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, you sure you ain't high still? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, because that's, man, it's, yeah. it's, it's a radical, yeah. it's a radical change. It's a radical encounter. It is. And I think sometimes, like... But that's the God of the Bible. Yeah. That's exactly. the God we read about. Look at the Apostle exactly. Paul. Exactly. Like, he knocked Paul, Paul was on his way to persecute Christians, mm -hmm. right? And, and and he knocked Paul off his horse. And I, and that's the God I read about in the Bible, you know? And and I believe he can do the same thing today as he did for me, for others. Yeah, no, amen. Yeah. I think yeah. I think there's definitely some, there's certain people that need that type of encounter. Yeah. Where it's like, and I think like how you were saying, like, um, that's how good God is, where it's not a, a, co a cookie cutter formula mm -hmm. of, all you do this, get saved, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Where I think there's definitely, there's certain people um, that need uh, radical encounters with God. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that they do have those encounters, I think just just shows us how how much of God, like how like how much he does. And, and like, it's not just one, like, he doesn't just save you this way. Like, he can yeah. save you different ways. Way, yeah. um, and it's just like, especially Paul. When we're going going to, to, to that testimony, you know, that the encounter that he had on his way to Damascus yeah. to persecute Christians. Yeah. But yet he had the encounter he had and through that encounter mm -hmm. he gets radically saved. Yeah, forever changed. Forever changed. Yeah. So much so where he becomes mm -hmm. where he wrote thirteen, fourteen books of the New Testament mm -hmm. and, and man, he became one of the main, um, one of the main people um, to reach the Gentiles. Yeah, and so I think it's people like that, you know, people like us, mm -hmm. where we need those radical encounters because, especially like I guess for our, where, where you and I could relate, yeah. we grew up hearing, you know, about God and, mm -hmm. and the gospel, but we still, despite that, still veered off, still went, mm -hmm. you know, opposite direction. Yeah. And yet, so I think people like that, people like us, we need radical encounters mm -hmm. because the fact that we grew up hearing about it, it almost becomes the moment we, we were doing wrong, mm -hmm. hearing about God, like it's there kind of in the back of our head, but it's not enough to where it, it's enough to change us okay. because we grew up hearing it. Yeah. Like we've heard it so much, so like yeah. it's just there. So religion. I think, yeah, it becomes, yeah, yeah it becomes religion, tradition, yeah. to where those radical encounters, I think, are a must. Yeah. And, and, and it does the job mm -hmm. because through those encounters, you know, God presents himself and man, yeah. and here we are. Saves families, <laughs> right? Saves families and, and other people through the testimony, you know, of yeah. what Jesus does. Amen. You know, because it's not anything that we have done. It's only what Jesus has done, 
you know, in, in our life, and he gets all the glory. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Yeah. So uh, to touch a little bit, so moving, I guess, a little bit forward from that, um, so you have a ministry, mm -hmm. um, Eagle Altar. Yeah. So around after, how long after you get you get saved does that come into play? So that happened probably a year or less than a year. Oh wow! God gave me the ministry, um, probably around two thousand, late two thousand nine or early two thousand ten. I was sitting at home. I was on the phone. So. I was out of work still a year and a half after I got saved. No job uh -huh. that whole time. Had to go to court. That's a whole testimony itself. My court case, mm -hmm. God delivered me. Didn't have to do a day, but in jail for that. The, my brother's words came to pass on that. Oh, yeah, for that 4 D Y. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that uh, came to pass. But um, what we what was the question? Um, how Something? long after you get saved uh -huh. does your, the ministry you're calling? Oh, yeah. So... Probably um, it was in between that year and a half of me mm -hmm. still being off work because I remember I was on the phone with un unemployment and I was talking to them and I was doodling. So I was just drawing on a paper. And uh, when I got off the phone, I looked down and I had drew an eagle on top of a um, podium where preacher preaches, mm -hmm. you know, the podium. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was just a picture of the eagle on top of the podium. And I heard eagle altar and I... And now, like Eagle Eagle Altar Ministries, right? Yeah. So God started really putting that on my on my heart, and I'm going to church and everything like that. And so I'm praying about it. I'm journaling everything. I'm writing stuff down, and um, I'm like Eagle Altar. I'm like that ain't even in the Bible. Like, <laughs> like I'm being taught like straight word, right? Not to yeah. believe anything but the word of God. God does nothing apart from His word, and trusting God's word and stuff. So I'm questioning everything that that's going on so i'm like eagle altar i'm like that ain't even in the bible so i started searching eagles in the bible mm -hmm. and see if they were and i started seeing yeah. you know uh, uh what was it um levitic it's not a Le exodus 19 he says i brought to you, brought you to myself i i delivered you from egypt and brought you to myself on eagle's wings yeah. right so god delivered he he references himself as an eagle in mm -hmm. the bible you know, and um, there's multiple references, you know, yeah. of eagles in the Bible. I didn't realize that. So I, I'm, i you know, I, I'm like, um, who, who's uh, the guy who did the, the fleece? It was uh, Gideon, right? He tested uh, God. Oh, yeah, three with, times. With yeah, three confirmations. So yeah. I'm like, okay, God, I said, if, if you want eagle, if you're telling me that Eagle Altar Ministries will be my ministry or the ministry, yeah. I need you. To have my pastor talk about eagles on Sunday yeah. service this this weekend, <laughs> so I'm like that, right? And so I'm sitting in service on that Sunday, following after I I'm praying and having conversations with God, you know, because that's what I was doing, talking with God. And uh, my pastor, he was getting getting done with the sermon, and he starts telling a story that he never told before, and he started telling the story about how a mother eagle chooses her mate. And how a mother eagle flies up high and she'll drop a stick and the male eagle will have to come and grab that stick. Yeah. And she doesn't molt. She flies higher and higher and drops it and sees if the male can come get the stick. Because when she has babies, if those babies fall out of the nest, yeah. she wants to make sure that father can oh, wow. come down and get those babies. And I'll tell you, I felt the whole, he started talking about eagles. I mean, it wasn't just an eagle. He told the whole story yeah, yeah. of these eagles. So God kind of gave me that confirmation. And I've never been anyone that does anything on my own. So I held the ministry within my heart. I got the 501c3, I think, in 2012, yeah. 2010. I got everything established um, with with the state and with the, with the federal with that and just, kept, just sat on it. You know, I said, Man. okay, God, whenever you want. Um, this ministry to go forward, um, you'll show me, you know. So in 2012, I had my first event at the Antioch Fairgrounds at a Christian event with uh, some Christian artists and, and yeah, yeah. people got saved and stuff like that. And then my pastor supported me with that. So it began as evangelizing, right? It's more of an evangel evangelistic ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, God says it'll be a ministry 
in which he brings his children back to himself to experience the love and life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the eagle's wings, right? He's, he's bringing his children back to himself to experience that true, true love and life-saving power of his son. So that's when he, he revealed it to me early on, and I just held it, you know, just like whatever, Lord, you want to do. And I just served at my church. You yeah, know? amen. And yeah. here you are, what, 12 years later? Almost 13? 16 almost, from 2008. Oh, since the, oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Since the ministry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Man. Yeah. And then 16, since 2008. Yeah, yeah. I, I got, that's the same year I got saved. Wow. 2008. Praise God. <laughs> yeah. I think I was uh, a little younger than you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, 2008, March, March, March 16th. Okay. 316. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Is when I got saved. But man, yeah, so Eagle Altar, man, uh, a ministry for 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 souls. Yeah. For sure. Um, you know, there's been a couple times where, where we've gone out together. Yeah. Um, you know, street preaching and and it's it's man, I could definitely say um your ministry, the heart for your ministry is the same that I have. Yeah, it's souls. For sure. And, you yeah. know, at the end of the day, it's souls. Mm -hmm. That's why, like, in the back of the street fishing shirt, yeah. it says, my only mission is soul fishing. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know, my, my, my mission is souls, man. Yeah. Or our, our mission is souls. Yeah. And, you know, just to reach reach the laws, mm -hmm. you know, reach people that, that, you know, that are still in the places that we come from. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely a... Uh, I believe it's the same, that same, especially because it's the same spirit. Yeah. The same spirit I have is the same spirit you have. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's something I believe it's, it's what God's called us to do. Definitely. And, you know, here we are, you know, today yeah. still reaching the lost. Yeah. Um, I guess to touch a little bit on that. So you guys, you and, uh, you and Gabe with Salvation in the Streets mm -hmm. go out, um, you want to touch on a little bit on that? Like yeah. how often you guys go out or where you guys go out? So uh, I'll share how it started. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, during the pandemic, right, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of churches shut down. Yeah. My church was one of them that shut down. And my pastor, my pastor died in November of 2019, so about four months before the pandemic hit. Oh, wow. So my pastor passed away. And I was doing all the teachings, right, on um, pretty much, well, I was, I did his eulogy or his his um, funeral at the church, and then I would do some teachings along with the other ministers at the church, right? But when the pandemic hit, I was doing the uh, live stream teachings. Mm -hmm. And then um, I told my pastor's wife, you know, a supporter in the ministry and stuff, she, she was grieving and stuff, pastor. Pastor Leah, I love her. You know, she's one my wonderful woman of God, yeah. and uh, I, and that's what, what my heart was to to serve, you know, and help any way I could in the ministry. And while I was doing that, God abrupted, uh, basically told me, "You have to leave the ministry." Oh wow! And so I didn't know why. Um, I you know I, I tussled with God. I'm like God, I. I, you know, I prom you know, promised Pastor Leah I would do this, you know, can I stay for this? So he gave me grace, you know, and, and meanwhile, before that, before my pastor passed away, um, the Lord had led me to start doing Bible studies. I was holding Bible studies at the Brentwood Community Center mm -hmm. on Tuesdays in Brentwood. So my pastor supported me in that. So I was holding my Bible studies that, but when my pastor passed away, I, I stopped those those um bible studies mm -hmm. to help support the church you know and um start doing whatever i can and then god told me you have to leave and i'm like why you know where do i go what do i do what am i supposed to do and um uh, he wouldn't tell me anything but you have to go and um i felt like when abraham you know when he told abraham to get out the yeah, land and yeah. just go abraham had to leave and and um that's how I felt. I felt like I, I was a ban I was being abandoned, you know, that I had to leave my family. Yeah. Only church family I knew for all those years that I've been saved. I loved them. I did ministry. I mean, every Wednesday, Thursday, first, I mean, well, Wednesday, Sunday, first Friday prayer. I mean, I was at church every time the doors open, you know, oh, serving. Man. And uh, my pastor passed away, man. I was hit. I was hit hard. And, um, and then God told me I had to leave. So I met, I sat down, you know, with the leadership 
and I told them what God was showing me, you know, and um, they supported me, they blessed me, and um, I ended up going out, and I, I sought after I left, God told me what I, uh, well, before I left, I had an idea of what I had to do. He mm -hmm. says, preach, 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 preach my gospel, and yeah. he showed me going out into the communities, right? Um, and at this time, we were, we were having, we started having church, right? When I left, we started having church outside, so... It was in the parking lot of our church. We had a canopy up and, and this and that. So um, I, I left. They blessed me with a 20-foot tent oh, wow. before I left. Um, they said, we want to we want to sow into your ministry. We want to bless you as you go. And so they bought me a 20-foot um, canopy tent. Yeah. And I, me and my family, we began um, setting up tent. I be, we began in Sycamore. You know, we were there for almost uh, a year. We'd make hot, me and my family every Sunday, we'd make hot dogs, get bottled waters and chips, and we'd fill ice chests up with them. We'd go into the community, we'd pray for people. Uh, people began manifesting, getting delivered, oh, set wow. free. We'd preach the gospel um, and just be there for the community. And then God would move us to another location, O Street. We were at O Street for a while, then we went to the Antioch City Park. So God was just transitioning, moving us. When he tell yeah, us yeah, to go, yeah. we'd move our tent, and we'd go to the new location. And during that um, fellowship church, um, a woman named Pastor Laura, she has um, the Dream Center Men's Recovery Home out in um, Bethel Island. Uh -huh. So she had a resource on these box foods that President Trump was supporting. It was called Farmers to Families. Mm -hmm. And these huge 18-wheelers were coming in with these refrigerated trailers with boxes of food they had milk oh, cheese wow. all this good food for families and they had they needed ministries to come and come alongside her so the hub location was fellowship church in antioch uh -huh. so all these ministries would come on saturday or sunday i believe it was saturday and we load trailers up with food like i would I, me and my family we would load our trailer up and i'd go to sycamore i'd go to each apartment going down honking and then started creating relationships with the oh, people, wow. feeding the people. This lasts for months, I believe, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, one day um, I saw this guy, he was loading a U-Haul. I would see him during the week, right? He'd catch my attention. It was, it was Gabe. And so I would see different people there. I'd help people. And one day I, I walked up, I said, Hey, you need help loading your truck. And I jumped into the truck and um, he's like, yeah, you know, and, and, Ever since he's like, let's exchange numbers. So we kind of exchanged numbers. We started talking. And I told him what I do. And I found out he was doing the same thing with his family that I was yeah. doing. He was setting up preaching the gospel downtown Antioch. Yeah. And I was across the other side of town with my family preaching the gospel. So we were doing the same things, but in separate locations already. So God connected us. And we got this idea. We prayed. And um, we said, let's start um marketplace preaching you know and we prayed we said well, what, what will be our first location and we came up with an idea we said we'll preach for seven days at seven different locations and we'll see what happens from there that was mm -hmm. in uh, february of 2021 our first spot was the um, walmart in pittsburgh yeah. where we went to we had probably like two people with us two or three people i think it was a samuel it was um his his father-in-law um and I think um, Porsche, uh, uh, two other people were with us. And we preached and we went to seven different locations for seven days uh, and see what God wanted to do. It, we didn't know if that would just be the end of our, you know, preaching together or if there's just something, you know, you know, we do, yeah, th people yeah. do things and that's it. And things don't happen ever again, right? I mean, until maybe a year later, maybe like, you know, how we had our events, we do them once a year. Yeah, yeah. They kind of dwindled away and stuff. Well, from that day on, it never ended. Um, it continued from February of 2021 till even today. The guys are out at um, Sycamore Park tonight. Today, we, yeah. yeah, we went. We went from uh, uh, one night a week for many years. We stay faithful. You know, sometimes it was just me and Gabe out there. Um, we just continued preaching, continued pressing on, going to different locations, preaching the gospel. And um, one night turned into you know two nights over the years. Two nights turned into three nights a week, and three nights turned into four nights a week, preaching the gospel in our Amen. city. People began to 
um, you know, reach out to us and, and, and call us about doing different things and stuff. But yeah. we're back to two nights a week right now. Uh, we have some people break off, go do their own thing, you know, which is, uh, which is uh, whatever. But, you know, we're down to two nights right now. We're Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay. And the gospel is still being preached. So that's how we connected. Amen. You know? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Definitely I didn't awesome. know that. Yeah. I didn't know how you guys connected. Yeah. So that, that man. <laughs> yeah, I just jumped in the back of his truck, you know. And, uh, and what's crazy is that um, Gabe had a dream. He told me about this dream. He didn't realize that he was he was uh, at this house, right? And he says there was like a, a, a stream down, and I hope I get this right, bro. You know, <laughs> he was at this house with, with another pastor friend of him, his. And he looked down the hill, and there was all these sheep. They were drowning. They were in water. Mm -hmm. And he says, we got to go help these sheep. So him and his pastor friend were down there, and um, they were pulling sheep out. And he said, uh, at that time, he turned around, and someone was behind him, and he didn't recognize his face. And he said, can I help you? And um, that person started pulling the sheep out with him on the side. And he oh, said, wow. when I jumped in that truck, truck. he sh God re revealed to him, I don't know if at that point or later, yeah. that that was the, per the person that was going to come and help you pull sheep, yeah. pull sheep out, oh, and wow. we began to work together. So I thought that was pretty amazing. That's pretty you know? cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. So God, I mean, God's amazing. You know, He's all about yeah. souls and sheep no, getting amen. saved. They're out there drowning, man, and and He's amen. waiting for for the labors to go forth and to be selfless, right? And just go out and say it's not about us, but it's about those souls that'll be saved and come to the kingdom. No, amen. Yeah. Amen. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. that's pretty cool and it's just like it just man just goes to show like how how god just already has everything connected mm -hmm. and it's just on his timing like we go through certain you know obstacles or, or you know our path it kind of goes up and down a little bit but yeah. ultimately his his plan is already strategically yeah. there yeah and so when you pull up finally like pieces come together yeah. it's just to us it blows our mind yeah but to him, it's just like and it was like, supposed to be. And it's like, what kind of, <laughs> bro? What kind of plan is that? I never wanted to preach the gospel. I never yeah. had a desire to preach the gospel. I had, never had a desire to serve God, you know. And so, how does he take somebody like that, like you, mm -hmm. and like me, that really didn't have that desire, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden transforms them into preachers, evangelists, oh, yeah. pastor, all this type for His glory? Only God can do that. You know, yeah. it's, like, I think it's like how Pastor said uh, yeah. yesterday. I think he said like what he how he say uh, never say you won't do something or yeah, you never do say it. never. Yeah, yeah, don't never. say you never do nothing because you'll be doing it. And it was like man, because so when I got saved, um, especially me having a father as a, as a pastor, as an yeah. evangelist, a uh, church planner. Uh, when I got saved, I was like, okay, cool. I was saved. But I don't want nothing to do with ministry. Yeah. Especially because I got to see, um, you know, not just like the what comes with it, yeah. the good, but the bad that comes with it in yeah. a way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know if bad is the right word, but just the struggle mm -hmm. that comes with ministry. Yeah. So when I got saved and, and even when I started to kind of get involved, so when I first got involved in church, it was music. Mm -hmm. I was part of the worship team. I was playing the drums, yeah, um, and the keyboard. But oh, you play keys? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so, uh, ah awesome. oh, man, hopefully Pastor Aaron's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> Put you to work. They already, they already <laughs> came up to me to yeah. try to get me on the drums, uh -oh. but yeah. But you know that was that when I got involved in that. Yeah. The one thing that I was. I don't want nothing with ministry. Yeah. No leadership position. I don't want to preach, teach. Yeah. I don't want nothing with that. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I'm, I'm gonna be cool here, just yeah. playing the drums. I'm cool. Like yeah. this is all I want. Mm -hmm. I don't want nothing else. Yeah. But then, you know, a couple of years go by, um, when I really started to get like serious in the word, mm -hmm. and I really started to feel like this, this, this call from God. Um, that's when like my mind changed yeah. so much. So like, it, like radically changed yeah. where it was like, man, now like 
I have this this desire, like this this call yeah. to to teach, yeah. to to you know, especially because at that time, I was absorb I was absorbing the word so much. Yeah. I was waking up reading the word, going to sleep reading the word mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. Because at the time I wasn't I wasn't going to school, I wasn't <laughs> working. Yeah. So all I had was time. Yeah. And I, I spent that time in the word. So when when the word when I started to get filled with the word, yeah. this like this call came on my life where like I need I need to share this. Mm -hmm. And and people don't realize it's the word. Mm -hmm. It's the word that transforms. People don't yeah. understand that. The more, if if people would get a grip on the word of God, and I'm telling you, if anybody's watching today, if yeah. you could just get the word of God inside of you, if you would consume the word of God as much as you consume Amen. your cell phone, your life would dramatically change. You would never be the same again. I mean, the word of God is living. It's actually Amen. alive. Amen. So when we read it, we're, we we have life-giving spirit inside of us. I mean, it's just it's just amazing. Yeah, not I don't amen. Think a lot of Christians read their word enough. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, yeah, for sure because I including think including myself sometimes. So <laughs> I'm not saying I'm super holy. You know, <laughs> I'm just saying I I know that's how the transformation came to me. And I heard you say you began. You had time. You began yeah. to read it, and that's when you sensed the call from God. When you started, you know, reading that stuff, yeah. you felt something. Yeah, and you yeah. know what? To yeah. to to kind of to kind of tie it in tie into that. So, um, so I was in a car accident, mm. pretty bad car accident, uh, a couple years ago. I remember. Um, you know, I split my head open, yeah. right, everything, and so at that in, in that point in time, I was actually not doing so good. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't necessarily in sin, yeah, but I was just in a place where because of what I was going through at the church where I was, I was I was pretty I was feeling pretty low. Yeah. I was kind of, you know, kind of depressed. Um, I didn't want nothing to do with ministry no more. Yeah. Like, I was really, really down. Yeah. Um, but it was crazy because, and I, I, I honestly believe that accident had to happen mm -hmm. <laughs> because it, it actually, it's what woke me up. Wow. And it's, it's crazy because I, I share this all the time where the crazy part is on my way to work, I'm praying. Mm -hmm. I'm praying, asking God, like, I know I shouldn't feel like this. Mm. And I just, I'm, I need a way out. Yeah. I need to get out of this. And then I, like, I kind of blink or open my eyes. I was praying. Yeah. And then the car in front of me slams his brake. I go to swerve. I hit crash into the, the yeah. center divider on the freeway. Yeah. And so the accident happened literally. As I like, <laughs> so be God. careful what you pray for. Yeah. <laughs> because sure. I believe God answered that prayer because... I couldn't walk, yeah. you know, because I, I shattered my ankle mm. and I couldn't walk. So for four months, I pretty much sat on a couch because yeah. I, I, I couldn't sleep in my bed because my bed was, was too low where I couldn't get up and out mm. from it. So I, for four months, I, was, I, I slept on the couch yeah. like a, in like a recliner that we have in our room. So for four months, all I had was time. Yeah. Cause I wasn't working, I wasn't, you know, going to church at the time because I couldn't walk, and so all I had was time. And in that time, what I did is I started reading the word, wow. and it was that that once again reading the word mm -hmm. and fasting while sitting there. Yeah, it's it's what sparked, it's re reignited that that flame, wow. and it just man, it completely woke me up. And it's, I mean, it's a testimony within itself where. So our mine and, and my wife's marriage was struggling at the time yeah. as well, and it was so much so that if we weren't Christian, we probably would have got divorced. Yeah, and with that, just with the simple act of reading the word, mm -hmm. it not only changed myself, it changed our marriage, yeah. it changed everything. I even like, um, I went like I finally was able to stick to the diet where I lost sixty four pounds. Uh -huh. Um, like it changed literally my physical, my spiritual, my mental, everything. Yeah. It changed everything from just simply sitting down and reading the word. Uh -huh. And I think we need to get back to that, man. Like as a whole, as believers, just quiet. You know mm. what I mean? Put the phones away. Get with the family. Yeah. Get with the word. Get with Jesus, you know, because we live in a, such a busy life, you know, I that know. we have so many distractions that pull us away and tug us 
in different directions. But you said something. You said something sparked, right? That yeah. flame ignited the flame. Yeah. When you said that, um, I heard the scripture that a bruised uh, Jesus, a bruised reed, he will not break, and a smoldering, smoldering flax, he will not quench. Right? Mm -hmm. That means like even if we have that little ember, like a smoldering flax is is an ember, mm -hmm. and it, it just needs that flame, right? It, it once it starts yeah. getting that flame, it, it the oxygen ignites yeah, it and the spark, the, the word of God, right? Amen. That it'll ignite that. I mean, that's that's the cure to igniting what's dwindling in our life. Yeah. The word of God to and, bring that spark back. And there you go. You fan the flame by turning them pages. Come on. There, there you, you go. go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's Holy Ghost inspired right there. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. definitely, um, man, makes me want to read the word. <laughs> right. Crack it open, yeah. But yeah, man. Um, man, it, it's 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 been good. And I guess yeah. the way we could we could end this with this episode is um if there's anything you would like to share, um, you know, just kind of like, I guess even yeah. to touch on reading the word, um, yeah. whatever, you know, you feel God leads you to speak. Um, yeah. I just want to encourage anybody out there today. If you're watching this video, it's not by accident. You know, God has a wonderful plan and a purpose for your life. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whatever you're dealing with today, I want to encourage you to call upon the name of Jesus. If you're a Christian, if you feel like you're getting separated or farther away from God, just get back into the word. Call upon the name of Jesus. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be delivered. And we serve a faithful, Amen. we serve a true God. You've heard, uh, you know, my brother Ezekiel and myself today just share about the goodness of God, the power of the word of God, how it changes lives. And we just want to encourage you today, just trust in Jesus. And I, I think if I could say anything, just trust in Jesus. Amen. You know, Amen. get into the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. With that being said, thank you guys for watching. Um, you God know, ho hope, to, hope, hope you guys share this video. Hope this was a blessing. So don't forget to share it, comment, let us know what you guys thought about this episode. Yeah. And I hope you guys have a blessed day. Yeah, thank you for having me. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless. Man. Street fishing, all up in the mission, saving other souls up from the opposition.